you guys very much for coming out and uh, you know spending your Wednesday night with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you guys learn a ton here. Uh, for Investors by Investors was actually, uh, uh, or Phoebe for short, was actually put together by uh, Alice here, or Alice, Jeremy here on the panel and uh, another investor by the name of Alice San Jose uh, that were tired of going and getting a sales pitch every single time at real estate investment clubs and wanted to go to a place that there was no boot camps or book and tape sets or upsells and things like that where, you know, the speakers lose all the credibility at the end, you know, so. Uh, but that being said, so Phoebe was born out of that. Uh, Dave and I started this club, and I run the Long Beach one. We have one in Pasadena, one in Orange County. Uh, if you go to meetup.com, and, uh, and you can type in FIBI, you'll find all of our different chapters. Uh, or if you go to forinvestorsbyinvestors.com, you'll also find our chapters there too. Uh, we strictly adhere with the uh, no sales pitch environment here. So uh, Dave and I, we get together and we, we bring up some questions that we want to ask different panelists that are experts in their field, uh, this one being syndication specifically, and we have three experts here to be able to talk to you guys and answer questions, and we really want this to be a Q&A, so if you have questions, feel free to bring that up, and we're going to call on you, okay? We're going to start kicking people out of the audience just to call on, so you know nobody wants that. Everybody's embarrassed to talk, so, and I have to do this every month, and every month I'm nervous to get up here and talk. <laughs> I'm doing it since 2008, you know, and now we have a lot of people in the room because top of the market again, so everybody wants to be real estate investors, right? So, <laughs> so who, who, here, who here invests in syndications right now? Okay. Who doesn't know what a syndication is? It's a very reasonable question. Absolutely. So a lot of people, this stuff is not taught in schools. Most people don't understand this investment stuff. So um, normally what we do here when we, we go over different topics is we just try to teach as much as we can. And so... Um, uh, what's going to happen here is we'll come up with these different questions in case you guys don't have questions. And so um, we just want to teach as much as we possibly can. Uh, we are recording it too. So um, so that will be available later on our website, forinvestorsbyinvestors.com. Uh, we also, as far as announcements go, we have a summer networking event coming up on June 7th. Uh, that is down in Long Beach at the Long Beach Grand Event Center out at Willow. And so uh, that will start about 6.30. There's no presentation there for that meeting. It's strictly networking, but we usually get, you know, 150 plus people at, at those events uh, with all the different Phoebe chapters combined uh, to come and just network with other like-minded investors, which is really the point of all this, right? We want to develop the resources that we don't have ourselves, and everybody in the room has those resources in one way, shape, or form, even if you don't know it, even if you're just beginning to, to start in this business. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dave and he'll tell you guys a little bit about uh, this club and you know some other announcements. I said, I don't know. Oh, you do. Yeah, you can yeah, hold so. Wow, the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> Which is dangerous. Yeah, giving Matt his own microphone scares me. But just, wait till <laughs> just, just hope politics doesn't come up. You know, and that'll be good. <laughs> cool. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Welcome to, to Keller Williams Beach Cities. And as Matt said, we've been doing this chapter for almost four years now, and, and um, we've got a great panel tonight. Um, you know, part of how we try to we, Matt and I think of us as we are real estate curators, right? We're, we're trying to put together people that we've dealt with or that we know have good reputations in the real estate business. And like all of our panels that we do, we don't ever want to have the same point of view whenever we have a topic. So tonight we've got three panelists that are all dealing with syndications, but all dealing, it from, dealing at it from a completely different angle. So we think we're going to get a lot of really good content tonight. And as Matt said, you know, we, we encourage this to be a, uh, we encourage you to participate. Um, if you've got specific questions about the topic, please raise your hand. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. If you've got a very specific question about your situation, save that towards the end, right? So a big part of Phoebe is all about the networking. Um, once we're done here and, and we really try to wrap up as, as close as we can to 9 o'clock, um, this whole space has to be turned over because we have a big meeting tomorrow morning at Keller Williams and we literally have people standing by to reset the space up. But right next door in this courtyard over here, North Italian, we have the entire patio reserved. We've got a bunch of food order. It, it, it'll be a cash bar, but you know, we're going to have everyone to stay and network. We're just going to do it over at North Italia. If you can make it, that's really where the magic of Phoebe happens. The education part of tonight is great, but really the way you take this and put it into action and put it into motion is by meeting people, meeting like-minded investors, and, and finding a way to, to kind of you know, get a deal off the ground. 
you know, we like to say there's no I in real estate. It's the ultimate team sport. And your success as an investor will be directly correlated to the team that you build. Right? We like to think that we attract quality people in this room. So spend some time getting to know each other and meet each other. That's really the art of the evening. Um, clearly, we don't do this for the money, as, as, as evident by the fact that we charge you the high, high price of $20 or $25 to come. Um, but we do help to pay for this with some sponsors. Uh, we've got a few of them here today. Uh, Jeff is here from Udirect. Jeff, there he is. So uh, we've got Udirect IRA. They, these guys, um, they, do, they specialize in doing self-directed IRAs. And actually, Karen uh, is on a panel next month. Right. So our, our meeting next month in June is all about investing in real estate for your children. Uh, and then Karen Hall, who's the, the owner of, of, of New Direct, will be here. If you guys have any questions about self-directed IRAs, Jeff's a good guy to ask. Um, actually, I know we've got um, Stephen Spear is also going to be in a panel. I think he's on a panel next month. He's on that same panel. Um, so, yeah, so um, uh, Stephen Spear with uh, Spear of Woodward, they're also they're a local attorney firm. Um, and and uh, we've got some representatives back here. Any legal questions that you have? on real estate, uh, we recommend you talk to them. Uh, Andrew's here uh, with uh, Andrew Wesley, he's a commercial lender, uh, so they're one of our sponsors. If you have any questions on commercial lending, you know, we recommend you talk to, to Andrew. Uh, I don't see Kyle here from SBTF Consulting. I think Kyle's actually our, our third panelist next month. Um, so um, and they've got information on the back table there if you want to grab some information. Um, is anyone from New Western here? Is that yeah, here? Right here. Oh, Brad okay. Thomas. Brad. Brad Thomas, how you doing? So, Brad, the, these guys are, uh, they do wholesaling in, in, a, in a very extreme, massive way. So, if you're looking for wholesale properties or looking to get into wholesaling, uh, you know, we recommend you talk to those guys. Um, am I missing anyone? I, I know we actually have, I was, I was, I was going to get to the, the overall Phoebe sponsors. So, for this particular club, uh, I know I'm missing someone, but we've got some. Oh, and then Farmers Insurance, that's who I'm missing. So uh, we also have uh, Jesse Navarro with Farmers, they're located in Redondo Beach, they also sponsor our group. And then, as Matt mentioned, Phoebe as a whole, we, we currently have five active chapters, we've got over 25,000 members, most of them here in Southern California. Uh, Carol Glover back there, um, her firm is the, is the firm that did all of our legal work for Phoebe, and these guys are our, they sponsor all of our Phoebe chapters. So. Uh, another really smart real estate attorney back there, and, and uh, actually Carol and Dave were panelists, what, two months ago? Yeah, so um, really smart real estate investors as well. Uh, next month, as I mentioned, it's going to be all about investing for real estate in, uh, for your children, right? So it's going to talk about generational investing in real estate. So if you're interested in that topic, uh, I think it's up on... It's up on Meetup. Okay. It's up on Meetup, so go on meetup.com and, and go ahead and RSVP. As you can see, we've got some limited space here, so once we get to 70, 75 people, we cut off the reservations and then you'll, you'll be on a wait list. Um, last thing that I'll, I'll talk about before we, we introduce our panelists here, just some logistical uh, components to this. If you do have to use the restroom, um, at the front desk where you checked in, there's a key, and just, just go there. If you walk down the hall on, your, on the left, you'll see where the restrooms are. Um, and then we do have some more chairs stacked up behind here. So if you need to grab a chair, just grab a chair. There's some room back here if, if you're stuck behind the wall or, or you can't see. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists. Um, why don't you guys each spend about two or three minutes Talk about your background and talk about how you're currently involved in syndications. Elizabeth, why don't you go first? Sure, happy to. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Raymond. Uh, I am currently with Realty Mogul. I started my career off as an attorney, a technology attorney, uh, and then did my first startup, which was a software company, uh, and then got into real estate when I moved to California and have been involved in three or four startup companies since then. Uh, mortgage companies, all, all in the uh, commercial lending space. Uh, so my last company prior to Realty Mobile, uh, we did CMBS, kind of small balance securitizations, SBA, and uh, small balance Freddie. Uh, and my current company, uh, Realty Mobile, is one of the largest commercial real estate crowdfunding companies in the U.S. And I used to say uh, we are the, one of the largest commercial real estate crowdfunding companies in the U.S. that doesn't really do crowdfunding. And the reason for that being that we weren't doing what was technically crowdfunding. So the JOBS Act allowed for uh, a certain number of things. 
we weren't really doing them, which was making investments available to non-accredited investors. What we were doing was private placements, which are syndications online. And while that was innovative, it wasn't really meeting the vision of the JOBS Act, or even us as a company, uh, to be able to make real estate investing accessible to everyone. But you still, at that time, which was three years ago, there were, weren't really ways to make real estate investing online accessible to everyone. Uh, there was Title III, which you could raise a million dollars, but you had to audit the financials. It just didn't make sense for real estate uh, until Title IV came along, uh, which allowed for these A-plus uh, filings, the mini IPOs. And so nine months ago, Realty Mobile filed our first A-plus, I guess we filed it prior to that, <coughs> launched our first A-plus offering, which is a public, non-traded REIT, and it is not a syndication, but it's very innovative in that it allows for non-accredited investors, which are people who make less than $200,000 a year or have a net worth of less than a million dollars, to invest online in real estate. And so we've been doing that. It's a pool of cash flow and commercial real estate. And the biggest innovation is we're not using the broker-dealer channel. So if anyone has anyone ever invested in a public non-traded REIT, uh, they have about 10 to 15 percent fee load, yeah. so that's the industry average, very high. Ours has three percent, so that's kind of the exciting piece there. But tonight we're going to talk about syndications. For us, all of our syndications are offered through Reg D 506B, and so our private placements are all for accredited investors only. So you have to have income of $200,000 over the last two years, or 300 if filing jointly or have a million dollars net worth, not including your primary residence. So we'll talk about those in further detail, but that's me and real to mobile. I think that's pretty awesome. You just said about 15 or 20 terms that nobody understood. <laughs> <laughs> A syllabus for the whole semester, right? We're going to talk about all that stuff. It was great. I know, right? you know, fee loan stuff and that kind of thing. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that. We'll, we'll dig into it. Yeah. I don't want to talk about REITs too much because we're not talking about REITs. It's, really, it's a hard topic to explain in you know terms that are more easily not in legal jargon. You know? Okay. But, so it's, fee loan just means your fees. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, so, so fees. for example, the fee loan piece. You know, normally people can make you know three percent more. You know, they have they have uh, capital raise fees and things like that that they throw into the syndication cost. And so she's saying some of these REITs can charge fifteen percent. You know, of, so for of every dollar dollars. that you invest, you're really getting eighty five cents. Right. So that's so you want to keep the fee load as low as you possibly can, so that most of the money is getting invested. So that was kind of the point of the fee load. Yeah, Sorry. and we'll but, talk yeah. about fees, but we'll keep it to private. Yeah, right. Right. There you go. <laughs> syndication. We're talking syndication. Here? Well, unlike Liz, I'm not a recovering attorney. I'm still an attorney. <laughs> so that. Uh, I am, however, a uh, recovering big firm attorney. I was at Latham and, and Shepherd Mall and some other ones. I'm at a, a more boutique, uh, smaller firm, uh, and it's Stein, Rubikoff, Levine, and Pham. Uh, a member of the transactional department. Uh, I do real estate syndications all day long. I've got about three private placements on my desk. Um, representing mainly the sponsors who are putting together multifamily, uh, other asset classes include office, uh, doing an assisted living deal. Um, so all kinds of things that put the sponsors of the real estate projects together with investors, which are sort of a, a short-term uh, way of saying what a syndication is, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, I will try to translate the legal jargon that uh, we are going to talk about. Um, and I'm especially excited to be on the panel with uh, Jeremy over here because the last time we were in a room together, uh, he said he looked at so many PPMs and syndications that attorneys didn't really add anything. So uh, I'll try to add something to that. Uh, and uh, we should even teach Jeremy something. I, 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 I love it that you're giving Jeremy crap at the same time. <laughs> just, just so you guys know, Dave and I, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, but not too much. Dave and I just went with Jeremy to Las Vegas to celebrate Jeremy's 10 years out of the corporate environment. You know, he's not really retired off passive cash flow. He could be, but he's also working, you know, still to find new investments and focus is really hard. We try to compare calendars to mess with each other. But over dinner, some of all the other guys wanted to embarrass him and kept saying, 
to Jeremy being rich every single time in front of everybody. It was, really embarrassed. It was, it was absolutely awesome. You know? And that's the only story we're going to tell. Yes. <laughs> the worst part of all this is that I actually couldn't drink at the time. So I was not drinking and listening to this all night. So. <laughs> Jeremy, why don't you kind of talk about your syndication background, please? Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> I got very scared about you talking about no, 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 no. <laughs> um, So let, before I start, since I apparently threw Peter under the bus at the meeting last time we had a meeting together a couple months ago, I do want to thank Peter, though, because I was thinking about the fact, I think, Peter, you've been coming to FIBM meetings probably almost 10 years now. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, we started them back in 07, so it's, it's possible you've been coming for 10 years, so thank you. That's why they keep around. Yeah. Had I had a chance to say that to him before his introduction, it might have been a little nicer. But anyway, um, so, my name is Jeremy Roll. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, as, uh, as Matt and Dave mentioned, I'm a co founder of Foreign Investors by Investors. And um, on the syndication side, I'm what I call myself a full time passive cash flow investor. So, I started investing in syndications or pooled opportunities with investors back in 2002. And between 02 and 07, I ended up rotating all my money out of stocks and bonds into it's mostly syndications into passive cash flow. So mid-07, I had a kind of last strong moment in the corporate world and decided to leave the corporate world because I had enough cash flow built up to live off of at that point. So ever since then, I've kind of been a full-time passive cash flow investor looking for more opportunities to reinvest my capital so I can continue my cash flow stream and never go back to the corporate world. And I, the vast majority of my cash flow all comes from syndications. So I'm very familiar with syndications. Um, I'm currently invested in over 70 different LLCs. I've invested in over 100 over time. Um, I actually am also an advisor for Realty Mogul, so I know this very well. Um, and um, I manage also an investor group of over 1,000 investors who seek other uh, passive investments in you know, cash flow real estate like me. Uh, I'm originally from Montreal. Uh, I have an MBA from the Wharton School, and I'm a licensed uh, California real estate broker, but only for investing purposes and uh, you know, for that. So um, anyway, thanks for having me. So, the first question is for Elizabeth, and why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, okay, there you go. I'll do that. Why don't you let me introduce you? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but I think they might do okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to tell a story in Memphis, but oh. no, no, that's okay. Oh, man. Yeah, there's going to be enough bad stories, so. We're going to save those stories for North Italia after the video, and there's a couple of good ones. So, uh, my name is Matthew Owens, I'm a California licensed CPA. Um, I quit my CPA from a job about 10 years ago. Uh, we've flipped over 550 houses now uh, in the last 10 years, and uh, we flip about 5 to 10 houses a month out in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we do a lot of value add multifamilies, we invest in syndications, we invest in promissory notes. And I act a lot like a financial advisor for clients that are looking for an understanding of what their capabilities are with regard to their cash flow planning strategies, their tax mitigation, and, uh, and legal structuring strategies. I don't charge for those types of services, I just like to help people because I find people are resources and there's ways to help each other out. And so if I help people, it comes back to me tenfold and a lot of people uh, refer me clients just for helping. So, uh, so that's my company in a nutshell where I'm based out in Orange County. I have a two-year-old right now that is bam bam, and he's breaking everything on the planet. So it's absolutely awesome, and you know I don't get much sleep, but you know it's great. So, <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, my name's David Coe. Um, my company is called the Coe Real Estate Team. I'm a licensed California real estate agent or realtor. This is my office. Welcome to Keller Williams South Bay. Uh, we specialize in doing a lot of distressed real estate, uh, both on the residential and the commercial side, uh, as well as just traditional residential sides as well. Uh, I'm also an investor and, and you know, invest full time. Uh, I run a small note fund. Uh, I've invested in some of the syndications. Uh, certainly not all 100 that Jeremy has, but uh, know most of the operators and, and have been involved in, in a lot of those deals and invested with Matt. And, um, so you know, I also kind of position myself as a real estate advisor. Um, you know, we've seen so many different types of real estate investing over the last seven years, and a lot of that exposure has come from from being a part of Phoebe first as a as an attendee sitting with Peter in the audience, listening to, to Jeremy explain what stagflation meant, uh, which was a great term in 2010. Um, and then from here, you know, I, I got involved on the, on the leadership side with Phoebe, and that's really where my kind of career as a real estate investor started to blossom. So, so thank you guys. Um, and then 
I'll send it off. So a little bit, why don't you start talking, I know you started talking a little bit about the syndications, but um, you mentioned some of the issues about the, to the 5016Bs and Bs and Cs. Why don't you talk a little bit about how syndications are structured and, and how they're different that way? Sure, happy to. Um, and I also wanted to just give a shout out to Jeremy, who is actually uh, one of our advisors and one of the smartest people I know. And am I allowed to say that I am investor with you? I guess sure. I'm allowed to say it, I just did. Um, <laughs> and I would be an investor with Matt if you'd let me. But uh, the, the, the <laughs> quality problems, Matt, quality problems. Um, 506B is a private placement. And what that means, or what that historically has meant, is that you have to be an accredited investor and you have to have a pre-existing relationship. And the pre-existing relationship part has kind of been an evolving thing over time. But as we are able to now, um, our, our platform is a broker-dealer. So we raise capital for third parties. So sponsors come to us needing capital. We raise the capital for them. Uh, and we put basically a Realty Mogul 59 LLC together. It's a um, SPE, a single purpose entity. And the purpose of doing this is because most sponsors don't want to have 50 or 60 investors in a particular transaction. It's not efficient for them because they're going to have to do 50 or 60 K1s, 50 or 60 distributions every quarter, 50 or 60 uh, emails out to all those different investors. So it's a very efficient and elegant way of doing business to syndicate by pooling all these investors and going through a platform like ours where we have the technology to be able to do all of the distribution through ACH, doing all of the reporting online, we have a dashboard, um, and we do all of the legal. So there's tremendous efficiencies to having a syndicator do all that work because we do all of our K1s are automated. We, we send out nothing paper, which is great because I'm in some private placements where I get checks every quarter and that's kind of pain and you have a lot of 70 checks every quarter. <laughs> He's like, has to go to the bank a lot. Um, it's mo mostly electronic now, honestly. Yeah. It used to be a ridiculous amount of checks. In the past three to five years, it's really transitioned. It's getting better because I, I literally have checks that just sit there and you're like, oh. When I was first starting to deal with Jeremy, like so many times he'd be on the phone and he'd be complaining that he had to go back to the bank to deposit all these checks, and I'd be like, dude, quality problems, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It does. You sound really stupid when you're like, I gotta go to the bank again. I gotta go to the I just, I just want to clarify. I did not expect this to come in here tonight, by the way. <laughs> but, but I just want to clarify. I, I have I, I have a pool of about 40 ATM machines. And I get a set. I used to get a separate check for every single one every month. So every month I gotta go, and then you know the, the, the machines didn't used to accept 10 at once. They used to be one at once. That's what I was complaining to you about. So somewhat fair. <laughs> and you get a check for 37 cents. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a certain elegance to the structure of a private placement. And uh, I am uh, Series 7, Series 63, so I'm allowed to actually sell securities uh, on behalf of our broker-dealer. Um, and when I talk to investors, you know, they often ask, like, what's the benefit of doing a private placement? And there's a bunch. Um, number one, you're getting uh, into, you're getting to diversify. So most sponsors don't want to deal with 50 or 60 investors. So for them to have a deal where they need 2 million, 5 million, 7 million, 20 million, uh, it's, it's, they're either going to get one, over 10 million, they could probably get an institutional investor, but under 5 million or under 10 million, it's, it's hard to raise capital when you take small checks. So most of those guys are taking 100,000, 250,000 and up. And for most of us, to write a $250,000 check is not an insignificant thing. And if you do it, it means that you can't get into multiple other deals. So to be able to invest for $15,000, $20,000, in a private placement, that allows you to do more deals, which means diversification of asset class, market, <coughs> sponsor. You're, you're, you're basically spreading your risk around. So if you do have a deal that goes sideways, it doesn't take you down. And I've had friends who said, oh, I put, you know, I lost all my money in a real estate deal. I go, how much money did you put into a real estate deal that you lost all your money? Like, oh, half a million dollars. Like, why would you ever, if that's all the money you have in the world, 
goodness sakes, don't put it into one deal. That's binary risk. It either succeeds or fails. And if it fails, it, it's, I, I get it. Sometimes we get kind of sucked into doing a deal that looks too good to be true. And maybe it is. Um, but, and in the past, it, maybe it wasn't even an option to go into deals at $25,000 a piece. So that's kind of where syndications, at least the modern syndication, used to be even that syndication, $400,000, $250,000, or $500,000. Today, you can actually get into private placements and syndications for much smaller check sizes, which creates diversification. You also are getting buying power when you work with a company like ours or, or another company that aggregates. Because there's uh, something we're going to talk about, I think, the operating agreement, which is really, um, and this is where I learned a lot from Jeremy, like the operating agreement is a critical component to the negotiating, and, and I'm sure you'll talk about this more at length, but it's, it has a lot of provisions in it that either protect investors or can really hurt investors. And when you're going in direct to a deal at 25000 you can't spend 15000 on legal. But when you're coming in as a group for a million or two million, and the managing member is able to negotiate the legal with the sponsor directly, it creates some efficiencies and some protections. So someone's looking out for your interest as an investor, and that's kind of what we do at our company, is we make sure that you don't end up signing into, getting into an agreement that has suckers clauses. So sometimes people that raise capital directly from friends and family, they get a little lazy, their agreements allow them to do certain things like, I don't know, commit fraud without being removed. Um, I still have a question. Interim or just wait to the end? Uh, if you have one, you raise your hand. We'll, we'll. Okay. Well, the question would be do you have a minimum size deal that you prefer that, that's cost effective? For us, it, exactly. So we can't raise, or we can't efficiently raise less than a million. For us, it's just the amount of underwriting, because as a broker dealer, we're a fiduciary. So we underwrite every deal. And a lot of broker dealers don't have a real estate focus. We only do real estate. So there's some broker dealers that outsource their underwriting. Um, I will tell you, I've read some of them, the, the quality of it is definitely not to uh, our head of credit Megan Goodfellow standards. Um, so I feel really proud of the product that we put out there because we really dig in. We spend almost a million dollars a year on data, like really looking at each market in a granular way. Um, and we're disciplined about our investing parameters. Um, so there's... There's different ways of doing it. I don't think there's any particularly right or wrong way of doing it, but a 506B is a private placement. And to finish up your question, a 506C is called a, it's a general solicitation, and the only real difference is 506B, you tell me you're an accredited investor, okay, that's all. That's the only due diligence I need to do. If you do a 506C, I have to say, okay, prove it. And with a 506C, I have to get your bank statements, your tax returns, your... Um, CPA letter, I have to actually prove it and have it on file that you're an accredited investor, but in exchange, I can market the deal generally. So I can go out to market, I can do a billboard, I can do radio announcements, I can do all sorts of things, which in the past, with a private placement, I have a couple deals on my platform right now, I can't even mention them in this room, because they're private. Um, whereas a general solicitation, you can scream it from the mountaintops and say, I have a general solicitation, I have this deal, doesn't mean you can invest in it. You may be that you're not an accredited investor, in which case you can know about it and not invest in it. So that's a big difference. Right. So, so Peter, on, on that, like most of these things have, you mentioned operating agreement, you mentioned PPM. Talk about some of the components of what the legal structure is on a, on a syndicated deal. Okay, can I just interrupt for a second? I'm sorry. Don't worry. I'm not going to do bad things to you tonight. Um, but, <laughs> just, just, just ask Jeremy and he'll be, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a clarification. So for those of you in the room who are not accredited investors, the 506B that Liz is referring to, um, Realty Mobile doesn't allow for um, non-accredited 506B investors, but if you're ever looking at one of those deals, some of them, some of, it's actually at the discretion of the sponsor. So some of them will require accredited investors only, but some will allow up to 35 non-accredited investors a lot. That's the maximum they can take. So there are some syndications that are 506Bs that allow for non-accredited investors and accredited investors, just not Realty Mobile. Thank, thank so, you for clarifying that. Yeah. yeah, no, we have no way of doing that because we have no way of doing that, but yes, you can have 35. And just to, just to speak English here with some of the language, um, a, a sponsor is basically an operator that's doing all the work on a deal. So a self-storage operator or a mobile home park, a mobile home park operator or a multifamily operator, they're going to different people like Realty Mobile to raise the capital for their deal. 
and the, all the 506 things she's talking about are just basically different filings with the SEC that you're allowed or not allowed to do different things with. Just kind of to clarify. So it's the operator picking out the real estate? Yes. Exactly. We, no, we are we are basically the, the, the marketplace. So deals come in, we decide whether we're going to do them, and then deals go out and we raise the capital. So we're a dual-sided marketplace. I say passive real estate investors who have money meet active real estate investors who need money. So that's kind of, the, hopefully that clear. Peter, could you kind of explain also in more simplistic terms what a syndication is yeah. in reality and then kind of the structures as yeah. well? Thanks. Sure. So the idea of a syndication is, is very easy. It's a sponsor who has a project, let's say it's a multifamily project, needs that person who has that project has the expertise, they have the property, but they need money. So they go to all of you, they go, they go to passive investors, and they bring in other people's money, basically. It's like that Money by Nature song, OPP, that is OPM. So a syndication really is just using other people's money to create, you know, build, add value to a real estate project. That's in the legal, trans legal jargon translated, that's pretty much what it is. Um, and these deals are structured pretty much of the two classes of equity. So the sponsor will have one class, which is the active, the manager of the sponsor class. Say that would be class B, class A, and these are normally structured as limited liability companies or sometimes, uh, and in the past, more limited partnerships. But the idea being the limited partner or the um, investor class is a totally passive class, meaning you basically give your money to the operator or to the manager of that, that syndication, and they do all the work. They you know, go rent the property, they build the property, they pick all the furnishings, they choose the tenants, and you say, hopefully they're doing a good job and they're going to come back and give me a check or 20 checks if it's you know, Jeremy's case. Uh, in my syndications that I did with you never never made money. I never got checks. So. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> yes. uh, they also take on the debt. So that's important Correct. to know because I forgot to mention that, and that's one of the big reasons why people like investing in right. uh, private placements is because you're not taking on the liability of the debt. Yeah. You're so, capping your your uh, exactly. losses. Could you describe the difference between structuring an LLC versus an LLP? No. <laughs> so, so I, I honestly, not to be glib, I mean, I, I don't really think there's that much of a difference if you're using an LLC or an LP um, from a liability protection. Uh, and I'm not a tax person, so maybe a tax person, but I don't think uh, as a passive investor there's any tax benefit or detriment. Um, I think the, the LLC is a more newer form of entity. Um, a lot of foreign investors and, and foreign jurisdictions don't have the concept of an LLC. So if you're raising money from foreign investors and um, you know other folks outside the U.S., I think people tend to use LPs because they're more sort of understood and have the word partnership in them. Um, but most of my clients these days use LLCs. I don't know if that's true for. Yeah, I'm going to say like it's 99 percent of what I see is all LLCs, yeah. and actually the only instance where I see an LP. There's an odd instance here and there, but being from Canada, if you're a Canadian investor, for example, and you invest in an LLC in the U.S., you have horrible tax consequences <coughs> doing that, um, which people don't realize there. Whereas if you invest in an LP, it's actually a lot more favorable because the Canadian government won't recognize the LP, but not the LLC. To Peter's point, so that's the only thing I can think of, honestly, yeah. um, in terms of the differences. So, uh, going back to the, the documentation, you have, uh, as was previously mentioned, an uh, operating agreement, which is sort of the details and the way that the company itself is controlled. And often you will have an entity that holds the property, and above that you will have um, the entity, let's say, the, the property is a multifamily, and I keep saying multifamily because a lot of my clients are multifamily operators. Um, so it'll have a single member LLC at the bottom that holds the property, and above that, to separate the liability from the property, you'll have the entity, another LLC, where the syndication is, and that is an entity where everybody's putting their money into, 
Um, and there's that class A and class B split. Um, the sponsor will be the manager of that LLC, and the investor will all be, you know, class A, you know, sort of passive uh, investors with very limited managing rights, operating rights. You know, they may have uh, voting on certain major decisions. Um, if you're lucky enough to be in a realty mobile deal, maybe they're bringing in more money, so they have a few more decisions. Um, and then you get all the way up to kind of the GB joint venture end of the spectrum where it's the sponsor and one large uh, either equity player, and somebody who's bringing in all of the money, and then you have sort of more ability to demand you know, more control and more voting rights. Um, so that's kind of the structure. And then you have uh, the, the private placement memorandum, as was previously mentioned, which is the sort of disclosure document 100 page document that you give to all of your investors if you're the sponsor that says, here's the structure of the deal, um, here's all the fees, and then you have 40 pages of, here's everything that can go wrong in the deal, and maybe two pages of, here's why you'll make money. <laughs> so, um, you know, and that, and that really is a disclosure document to tell your investors, and particularly important if you have non accredited investors, um, although we can talk about when you use a PPM or when you don't, but um, you want to tell all of your investors as a sponsor, um, you know, here's all of the risks, here's everything that could go wrong, here's all the people that were you know, gonna make gonna make fees before we pay you, and here's how you're gonna make money. So everything is disclosed and nobody can come back and say, you didn't tell me this property was built on a gas station. Well yes I did, it's on page 67 of that hundred page document which you said that you got. <laughs> so, and just, just to clarify as well, when you're, all this is, is um, you have your, your operator, your, your uh, sponsor that is buying an asset in an LLC, you're buying shares of the LLC that basically own the asset, and you are passive, you're giving up control for, and you're, you're relying on the operator that you've done a lot of homework on before you invest with them to do what they say they're going to do, and you've done the background checks, you've gone through and did all the homework on these deals to make sure that happens. And then you have a PPM, which is almost another word for a, a, a legal, legally written uh, business plan. And then the operating agreement basically says, this is what the operator can and can't do. So in, in simplistic terms, if Peter's going to clarify for sure, but you know, I'm just saying like in, in very general terms. Well, you also need an executive summary, don't you? Choose an well, yeah, I mean, the, the PPM is, is definitely much more than a business plan. The, the, the business plan, um, background of the principles, that is all part of the PPM. The, the real purpose of the PPM is for all of these disclosures of all of the risks and, you know, everything that is going to be paid to the manager. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically a big insurance policy for the sponsor, is what it is. Because you're, the more you disclose, the more you have written, and that you're putting in front of your, your investors, the, the people who are putting money into your syndication, the harder it is for those people to come back and say, you know, somebody's going to find a smart contingency lawyer to try to say, well, you guys committed securities fraud because you didn't tell us, you know, X, Y, Z fact. Um, and that's why even in a lot of situations where deals have only accredited investors, um, a lot of my clients who are raising a large amount of money, they will always do a full private placement because of that disclosure risk. Um, I don't know if you want to keep talking about PPMs, but. Yeah, can, I, can I just try to, yeah. I know it's a very complicated topic, just from an investor perspective, the easiest way to think of it is you're gonna get three documents initially to re review, typically. First is an overview, which could be between 10 and 30 pages, which is your basic business plan or high-level overview. I call it a business plan, and it's an overview I'm trying to understand what the operator is trying to accomplish. And then the second document would be the private placement memorandum or PPM, which is this 100-page document the attorneys typically put together that has all the risks and a little more detail about um, what's going to happen and the opportunity. And the third one is the, the LLC operating agreement, which is basically the rules that dictate what the um, managers allowed and not allowed to do. Literally, it's the rule book for the um, LLC. And they're all very important because you want to read the business plan to start to get a high level. You don't need to bother reading the PPM if it's not a good fit for you, right? So the first thing you do is you read the overview, determine if it's an opportunity that makes sense for you. 
Then the second step could be to read the PPM for the risks and disclosures. I like to say that reviewing the operating agreement is very important too because, like Liz mentioned before, there could be some rules in the operating agreement you may not agree with. It could be about cash calls and maybe they're forced or not forced and have all some delusion in it. Delu uh, there may be reporting or not have reporting requirements that, you know, not to protect you. So there's all these things you look for in the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're all, they're all serve a different purpose. They're all very important. So, yeah, go ahead. Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, the answer is it's not mandatory. And so what I normally see is between zero and 10%, we call it a co-investment. And when they invest in the opportunity, they normally invest in the class A shares that Peter was referring to. They're actually on the investor side of the table in terms of making money off their own money. And the other share that they end up with is on the other side of the table, which is typically behind investors. Usually investors have a preference in terms of getting their money back. But I think that optimal, I would say, is 10% or more. Um, and then, and, and as an investor, you have to make a decision as to what requirement you have. Some people may not invest if it's less than ten percent. So some people might be okay. I'm okay with zero, with the right operator, with the right circumstances. Not everybody is. So, Barbara, you have a question? Yeah, we're, we're talking about how to get into all these things, and I know some opportunities are to build, and then there's obviously an endpoint, and you're getting out. But um, I get um, emails all the time from this group. Um, you know, apart with mentors, and um, there are a lot of opportunities to get in, and you're in it forever. You know, so is this a lifetime investment? Or Highly a liquid. Yeah. Highly liquid. Okay. So anytime you're getting into a private placement, mm -hmm. the sponsor gets to determine when, and, and sometimes you might have a buy-sell agreement at some point in the future, which is another reason why the aggregate buying power of, of being in a syndicate group can help. But for the most part, when you get into real estate, you have to know that you don't want to set a, at least we've chosen not to force uh, an end date. And the reason for that being is you could say that you're going to be able to execute on your business plan in three years, but three years comes and the market's tanked, but the property's cash flowing. I don't want to force that guy to sell at the bottom of the market. And real estate's very cyclical. So, Equally, he gets an offer, and we've had 10 deals go full cycle that we weren't planning on have go full cycle this quickly, but the sponsor got an offer he couldn't refuse. So I don't want to tie his hands on that either. So you have to give the sponsor some flexibility, and when we underwrite, we underwrite it with a target hold period. So you'll see in investments that will say it's gonna, they're targeting a three-year hold, or a five-year hold, or a seven-year hold, or a 10-year hold. But the truth of the matter is, these are um, private placements, they are not publicly traded, and they are highly illiquid, so once you're in it, you're in it until the sale, for the most part. I mean, okay, but yeah. could you have someone take your place? Like, couldn't you sell If the sponsor agrees to it. So yeah. usually the operating agreement will limit your ability to transfer shares right. until they, without their approval. Okay. But yeah, I mean, there's there's been talk of secondaries for, for a long time, it's just, it's complicated to do. Yeah, and, and that's one of those provisions that you really need to dig into the operating agreement to look at. Because it may say, you know, you can't sell at all without the manager's consent and the manager can decide and it's sole discretion. Um, and you want to know that you sell your interest, you know, you may be able to put it into a trust, um, sell it to another existing investor in the deal, maybe. Uh, but, but typically, you know, you're in that deal for four or five, you know, whatever the target hold period is. And, and sometimes, and again, it depends on the deal, um, you know, there may be a deal where it says, we're planning on holding this for 10 years. Like, I, I just did a deal which says the whole period is 10 years, the operator can sell a year uh, before or after, and if he wants to hold it, continue to hold it after that, he has to put it to a vote. Now that's a, you know, a smaller syndication with some larger equity players, but that's, there, there's a lot of variations, but it's one of those terms, transfer provisions, you know, how long am I going to be in this thing, you really need to understand in the same deal. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I would say that there, there is no one way to uh, syndication, it, it's, how the, it's how the operator structures the agreement.
agreement. And as an investor, there are some investors that like to be in shorter term investments because they like the idea of having access to their capital on a more regular basis. There are some investors that want to place the capital and have it placed for a long time, so you're not constantly having to make decisions, right? So that's also your job as an investor is to understand that timeline and make sure that matches up with whatever your requirements are. Um, yeah. Jerry, talk, talk about that, and then also, I mean, we've been talking about the structure a lot. There, there's certainly some pros and cons on these things, uh, on being in a syndication, you know, illiquidity is one of them. Talk about some of the pros and cons of the syndication structure, and more importantly, you, you clearly have invested a lot of it. What do you like about that? Okay. Let me just let me just continue on the topic from before though. So let, let me just generalize, sorry, and give you 80% of what I see, which is basically it's either a five or ten year term from an investor perspective, and that is basically setting an expectation. It does not mean usually there's no legal obligation for the property to be sold in five or ten years for the exact reasons that Liz mentioned. It's usually actually to help investors as well. So uh, an operator, if they put a 10-year term on it, you have to understand they're trying to build long-term relationships with investors, so you'd like to think that they're going to want to sell within 10 years, plus they're typically refinancing a loan, which will cause them to actually force them to do something, whether it's refinance or sell. So if you're, you're looking at a 10-year term, you could probably expect it to be somewhere 10 years or less, but it could go on for 15 or 20 years because there's no legal obligation, the market conditions may not be right, and frankly, your tiny percentage ownership doesn't give you any control, which is one of the things I'll talk about. In a second. So, so that's the reality of, of the, how long you typically go on for. Now, the most common, and it, this can be done anyway, but the most common thing I see if you want to sell your shares is that first of all, it's illegal to say, sell your shares within the first year according to the SEC. They don't allow you to flip your shares. So you cannot sell your shares for the first year. And then after that, and correct me if I say anything wrong, please. So um, after that, um, you basically, um, there are rules in the operating agreement that dictate if you can sell your shares and how you have to sell them. So what I mean by that is that usually the most common thing is that the operator has the sole discretion to accept or reject you selling the shares. Most of them will typically conform because I'm guessing there's some liability so if they block you for not a good reason. But um, And one thing you have to con consider as well that you have to read in the operating agreement is often there's first rights of refusal of, of either the operator buying your shares or other investors buying your shares. Now, or both, and actually, the, so that could be a pro and a con, because it's a pro in that you may have someone, you know, a pre-built way to actually sell your shares. The con is that, let's say your friend wants to buy your shares from you, and you've got like, your friend's standing there, I'll pay you, that sounds like a great deal. Sometimes there's a first right of refusal for the operator for like 90, could be up to 90 days to buy your shares. So they have 90 days to say no. Then you've got the investors who may have another up to 90 days. Usually it's more 30 or 60, but it could be up to 90 days or whatever it says. Six months later, your friend's sitting around waiting, and they, they've done something else with their money. And nobody else wanted to buy the shares in the meantime. So you need to really consider it illiquid and only kind of having to liquidate in case of emergency. So you have to be willing to part with this money for typically a longer term. And the, the, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll move on to that question, is that this is a very illiquid market, and therefore the buyer has a lot of control in the negotiation. So I would not expect to get 100 cents on the dollar of what, either what you put in or what it's truly worth today, because you're not going to go pay X thousands of dollars probably for an appraisal to prove what the property is worth at the time, even if you have an idea of what it might be worth or a range of what's reasonable. So an investor is taking a risk if they're coming in and replacing you, and usually they're going to negotiate a discount because of the liquidity and also because they're moving into an illiquid position as well. So selling is not optimal. It's not impossible. I've actually been involved in, in purchase transactions. I've sold shares myself before. I've seen other people do it. Um, it's not impossible, but it should not be done unless it's the last resort, in my opinion. There's just too many cons associated with it. But that's, that's what's good about the amount of money that you can invest. It's, it's smaller chunks of money that you can diversify across the board and, and really not have to get out if you don't need to. So, question. I just wanted to hear you guys' thoughts on the secondary market. So the current state of affairs in the secondary some of these types of syndications were all more REITs is what I see the trade. Um, but I think we were seeing a lot of really low of them there once. And maybe a couple other got They about. never got a yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I talked to the guy. That was, was a while back. Yeah, he was like, well, if we were going to actually get someone to buy it, then we would come to you. Uh, uh, but it is interesting. Our name is on there. Um, we have not. I mean, because we would have to go. I, I believe I I think as they would be buying basically shares in our LLC, but there are uh, wide-reaching implications 
So you also potentially have to get approval from the senior lender. So it's 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 complicated. It's not that simple. These are these are not intended to be freely traded uh, securities. Way, it's way too complicated. I've seen some companies try to do it. Well, they might want to partner with a crowdfunding site and say, look, we understand how this crowdfunding site underwrites, so we can trust that if it's a realty mobile deal, that they've had 10 people look at it, underwrite it a certain way to a certain uh, you know, quality, and so we'll we'll create a platform where we know that if we get a realty mobile deal up on the platform, it's starting from a really good place. The problem is that like, if the sponsor ABC has a deal I invested in, and they're fraudulent. I go sell because I think they're fraudulent. They have no way of knowing it. You know, at this point, they don't know them at all. They have no, no, no idea how to deal with them. It's a lot of work to be able to really get down to it. Frankly, that all the information is confidential. They may not be able to get access to any of it to even look at it. It's, it's um, really, really tough. And and think about how much an appraisal costs to sell twenty five thousand dollars on a three thousand dollar appraisal, and then have your attorneys get involved. Yeah, I mean, there are, or there have been these sort of secondary markets that have tried to crop up. And, and if you think about it, like, like Realty Mobile has done, I mean, the, the internet seems to be the ideal place to bring all these folks together, and there ought to be a, you know, a marketplace for these, you know, interests in various indications. But, but remember, you know, the, the going back to the 20s and 30s when all the securities regulations were promulgated, they were promulgated because of all the fraud, you know, the 33 Act, 34, you know, all of the fraud that was going on in the markets. And so there really was this divide between, okay, if you're going to announce your deal and it's going to be available to the public, that is a public offering. You have all this slew of stuff and, you know, that you have to disclose and financials and money. And on the other side, you have you know, private exempt offerings that are really private. There's a little bit of a, of a blurred line now. But if you have a whole, mar a whole new marketplace where all of these you know, syndication pieces are available, and like Jeremy said, nobody can do, you know, the, the people who have or maybe not have done diligence on those are not the people who are then in the marketplace, and you have no way of regulating that. I, I think there's a long way to go before that is applied. I mean, it seems like it should be, but, you know, there, but I think there's a long way to go to get to a, a secure marketplace for sort of the secondary trading of syndication interests. We'll go here, then we'll go here. Thank you. Hi. Um, we are actually on the other side. We're operators, and so we put deals together. And I was wondering, you know, so far, we, we've been really, we try to be really good about vetting our investors and making sure that it's a fit both for them and for us. But I'm wondering, you know, as our experience continues, I'm sure at some point there will be an investor who is a pain in the butt, is something happens, I don't know, asks, you know, is challenging everything and becomes difficult. So are there ways in the operating agreement or some way in the deal to set things up? I mean, we, you know, we have, you know, we have a very specific, we, we have all the stuff that you're talking about, we do all of that, we put all our disclosures together, we have operating agreements, we send all of that stuff. But I'm just curious if you have seen situations where specific investors get difficult and if there are ways to try and prevent that ahead of time and if you can't what do you do with somebody's can you kick somebody out I guess it's, it's like riding a motorcycle it's not when it's not if you're going to fall it's when there's some crazy investors out there yeah. yeah no I mean the, the answer is you absolutely the more deals we do you absolutely will have investors who will give you a hard time and it, it tends to be I mean assuming that you're doing everything correctly and you're, you know, abiding by, you know, tends to be often smaller investors who give you a hard time and make the most noise. They're um, the most stressed because they are putting more of their money on the line. Yes, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. but, and there are things you can do, um, you know, we've drafted provisions where if certain things happen, the sponsor can force a call right to get to buy the shares back, but and this may be a question that comes later, the most important thing you can do is get to know your investors and vet your investors just like they're vetting you and make sure that, you know, your investors really, even though they may be signing, you know, a subscription agreement that, yes, I've read your disclosures, like, you know, if you can, you want to make sure that they really do understand that. 
you want to make sure if you're doing a 506B, even though they may be signing a accredited investor questionnaire, if you have any inkling that maybe they're not, or maybe they're not sophisticated, you know, the, the I mean, I can draft you a 100-page PPM all day long, but if your investors don't read it, they don't understand it, you know, if, if the operator doesn't abide by it, I mean, the most important thing is really to get to know your investors, and I think the same is true from the investor side. You know, to Jeremy's point, you really need to get to know your operator. Way more important, I hate to say it, but then the legal documents and we'll do it your book for you, Jeremy. <laughs> but to, to, so, answer, to answer her questions real quick, they may not be able to kick them out, but they could buy them out. Yeah, so I was going to say, there, I have two suggestions. The first one, the most common way that gets resolved is typically a buyout. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting you make someone an offer that's so amazing they just get them out. That's not what typically occurs. But that's, that's the number one thing that I see happen when that happens. And it's not that common, but it definitely happens. Um, the other thing I would caution you of is that some of the buyback provisions and stuff, because I mean, you can put anything you want in your documents, but if investors actually read it and see it, I would say that, you know, I end up consulting on a lot of different opportunities too, so I get both sides of the coin. And the thing that I always tell uh, the sponsors is you want to create the least amount of hurdles possible to like not give someone a reason not to invest. Hurdles can be all kinds of different things. It could be a structure they're not used to seeing. It could be um, certain provisions in the operating agreement that they're not used to reading. And if they see a buyback, like if I saw a buyback provision and it was kind of more of a blanket provision that gave you a lot more power, I probably wouldn't invest because I'm not going in with the intention of getting bought out of car in four years from now. I'm actually taking equity risk and want to actually participate in the upside, for example. So just be careful if you're going to consider that type of thing. Yeah, I think that's like a lawsuit waiting to happen. Because I know as an investor, I've gone into deals and I saw buyback and I was like, oh gosh, no. Why would I ever do that? Why would I put myself at risk that they're going to, that the deal's going great, and then they come back to me and they go, yeah, it's doing so great. Thank you so much for giving us the money to buy into this deal, and now that it's de-risked, and now that it's doing great, I'm going to buy you out. Uh, yeah, no, no. I, I wouldn't do it personally, but I do, I, I think, to we're, your not, point, we're not doing that. No, 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 no. But to your point, what, what you can do is just not let an investor that looks like they're going to be problematic into future deals. So there's nothing requiring you to continue a relationship with an investor who's starting to show signs that they're going to be difficult. And as you get bigger and as you grow, you don't need them. You don't need the headache. And if they are a smaller investor, you just, frankly, you just stop showing them deals. And I mean, you can do that. Yeah, to be honest, when you, this is probably one of the most important things you can do when you're raising capital from investors is making sure that they really do understand what you're talking about. I've had investors that they've signed trustee releases and, and sent it to closing and knew they were getting paid off and then get paid off and then yell at my closing agent that they got their money back. You know, I mean, there's crazy people out there that you have to be careful about. And, and to be honest, you know, this one investor, I stopped in letting invest because he just, even though it was over and over the same investment type, he just was not getting it. It wasn't clicking in his head how it worked. And, Understanding that up front will avoid so many problems down the line, right? So understanding that they're emotional or not too can, can be a problem as well. And understanding that and making sure that you explain it until you're blue in the face if you're really having an investor that you're not sure of. Question, Chris? I was just uh, asking about the upside of these such a big year every day. Are they cash flow investments? No, literally. The, so the question was about the upside and what type of investment. I mean, literally, you can. Any, any risk spectrum you can look at. I mean, you can look at a development that will last for five years before it's even finished, and you can look at something that's cash flowing, that's 100% occupied, 300 unit apartment building, that literally will start to accumulate cash flow the, day, the minute you close. So I'm very low risk, um, probably more so than normal, and so I live off the cash flow and completely depend on the cash flow, so I look for predictability and I go into really stabilized stuff. But that you can find everything and anything and anything in between. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start. So I'm not, an, I'm not an accountant or an attorney or anything. So you know, I'll just give you my perspective as an investor. So one of the great things about real estate is that there's certain tax um, deferral, uh, let's call it. So it's, for example, depreciation that you get to actually throw, flow through to you. So you know, in a way, because of the way I invest in most of the deals that I invest in, it's, I have like an unfairly low, uh, really unjustly low tax rate. Because at the end of the year, let's just say that uh, opportunity X, this apartment building in Texas, I got $1,000 of cash flow in a year. 
usually my K1, which is the tax statement, says, you know, income X, but then net taxable income is like negative $40 or something. Because the expenses and the depreciation flow through is defer the taxes. Now, you don't not pay the taxes. You have to pay them at a later date. But you do pay them back um, and recapture at the capital gains rate, which is very favorable, right? So it's not ordinary income. So you have both the benefit of paying it at the moment at a favorable at a favorable rate in the future, and you also don't uh, necessarily. And it depends on the asset class too. So mobile home parks, for example, you get to depreciate the land more quickly than normal land. But you don't necessarily have 100% tax deferral because depreciation doesn't necessarily cover everything. Whereas an apart building is more commonly something you may get full deferral on because you're actually got more structure that you're actually depreciating. So everything's different. But it's definitely one of the advantages of investing in real estate specifically is a lot of the tax deferral. But, but if you're investing in a note fund, you don't get as much tax advantages because you've got paper, you can't depreciate that. So just yeah. like the individual asset will have tax advantages over other asset classes, the same thing happens syndication it depends on what the asset class is being syndicated is. We had a question here and then I'll go over here. Can, can you talk about your experience with calls for additional cash infusions? How that how that has worked and we don't do them. So we negotiate with our sponsors that we will not accept capital calls because we can't. Our investors are coming into a single purpose LLC. It's one of the other benefits of working with a syndication platform or someone who's doing syndications is if I have 50 people in my LLC that's invested into the title holding entity, and one of my 50 guys says, I'm not calling, you know, I'm not coughing up 50 bucks, well, then everyone else is a default. So I necessarily can't permit capital calls because it could allow unfair dilution. It, it's, um, we'd be in violation of the operating agreement if we permitted it and, or had a requirement and we weren't able to meet that requirement. So I can't put my investors in that situation. So what we do instead is one of two things. We can either allow the sponsor a pre-negotiated loan, member loan. So a sponsor says, if I need additional capital, and by the way, I've now incentivized him not to, have to, not to do this because of the terms of whatever we, we do negotiate with him, he's not going to be able to take advantage of a capital call, and he's actually going to probably um, hurt a little bit if he does a capital call, so he's incentivized not to do capital calls. He can either do a member loan and cap that so that he's not able to, to unduly profit because it is going to be dilutive to our investors, or he can do a one-to-one -one dilution. But in no event is he able to do something where he can dilute us um, disproportionately for not coming in with the capital. And because we're aggregating all this capital and coming in with meaningful checks, the sponsors generally will agree to that term. But it is a big deal um, because we're saying to our investors, if you put in $25,000, you're not signing onto the debt, and that loss is capped at $25,000, which, as you know, in real estate is not necessarily the case because if you put money into a buying a house and you sign onto the loan and the thing needs a new roof, well, you might end up both being liable on the debt as well as having your own personal capital call having to come in with additional capital to, to do uh, expensive uh, repairs. Yeah, I would say it's rare for me as a, as a person who represents sponsors quite a bit, you know, other than in a, in a JV context, it's, it's rare to have a deal where you're syndicating out and there is a, a mandatory or the ability to call additional capital. I mean, I think Maybe if you're purchasing multiple assets and you're doing stage closings, but one of the things to look for in a sponsor is this person is you know, buying a property, they're doing a value add, they know exactly how much money they need for both the purchase and the renovation that they're planning on doing, and their budget is gonna match what they're doing. And they're not gonna get halfway through that renovation and say, oh, we need you know, another million dollars, everybody can pony up more. So I, I think, I think if you, you know, looked at a lot of these, if you see a syndication that has a mandatory additional capital call, that's potentially a red flag for, you know, investing or not investing in that deal. What do you think, is there any positive benefits of having a capital call, Jeremy, into, into one of these funds? Um, I would say positive, I think it's a necessity though. So if, they, if someone gets stuck and then there's an unforeseen need, then there has to be a way for them to be able to raise the money, let's say, short of handing the keys back to the bank to hold property. So I think it's important to have 
What I would say, I, I would, this is actually probably one of the top 10 things that I look for in the operating agreement is the capital call provisions, because I've seen some interesting things over time. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Like, if this is why it's important to read the legal documents. So there was one deal I, I'll never forget that I saw um, that if they, if they request, so, so let, me just, let me just backtrack for a second. Legally, if you're a passive investor in these types of structures, you're limited to the uh, initial amount that you invested. They cannot actually require you legally, force you to actually put more money in. So that's number one. You cannot be forced or sued to put more money in. So if there is a capital call, then um, typically there's either they're going to request it either as a loan or as equity. And I'll get into that in a second. But the one thing that I saw um, once was if, 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 if they required a capital call for any amount of dollars for any reason, if you didn't actually give them money within three days, you were diluted by 50% of your holdings, no matter how much the capital call was. Now, I actually looked at that and said, like, God help the investors who didn't read this and are just going to invest, because that's really what it comes down to, right? Anybody who reads that and who understands it would probably at the very least question it and hopefully just not bother investing in it. And this is why it's important to read documents, because the, the sponsors can actually put any rules in place that they want. This is why it's right. important to get an attorney if you don't understand this stuff to review this. Like Someone like Peter that can understand those types of provisions that can really help you. Yeah, so and not a trust attorney or not your brother-in-law who has a law degree, someone who does this all the time. And I just want to point out that I'm not saying that that operator was fraudulent, I don't know them, but you know, if I'm the operator and I put that rule in place, well, I'm going to put a capital call in day three for a you know, million dollars a person, and then if whoever doesn't give me a million dollars gets the loot, I, I get 50% more of the equity in like in three days, right? So, I mean, and literally, you go sue that person, and that, those are the rules, and there's actually, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not an attorney, but... Theoretically, legally, I don't think I have any actual recourse, right? So it's really important to read the rules. But um, what I would say, what I look for is, um, and actually, I sometimes I'm in the position of negotiating on behalf of my investor group for these types of things. And one of the things I like to negotiate is, um, I like, I prefer to see that a capital call start with debt or a loan, so that I'm not being diluted. So the first, I like to have it in four steps. So step one is. Um, you know, the ability for the sponsor to get a loan from an individual member, so an actual investor in the, in the deal, uh, at a predetermined interest rate. And then number two is if it can't, if no one's willing to provide a loan, then go ahead and get a loan from somebody else at a capped interest rate from the outside. And then step three is, okay, if we can't get loans, so now we're in a debt position, so now we're going to go start to like, look at dilution. So take equity from the original investors at that point first. And then whoever can't actually cover that, you can go get equity from other investors outside. That's what I personally like. It's just my own preference. And that's what I try to negotiate usually. There's pros and cons to doing it, you know, debt or equity. I just don't like the idea of getting diluted uh, in case it happens. And, and can you talk, I mean, explain dilution. I don't think everyone maybe grasps what that means. Dilution. So, okay. So, um, trying to think about the easiest math to use for this. So let's say you invest a dollar and they need another 50 cents from you because something has gone way wrong and they didn't predict that. You can't afford to put that 50 cents in. Somebody else is putting it on your behalf. So you would have been in at $1. fifty, but now you're in a dollar, so you're gonna get diluted down. Your, your ownership interest is gonna go down because you couldn't fork up the full dollar fifty. And whoever else puts that money in your place is gonna get that percentage of shares away from you. So you had a 100% of your shares here and now you've got less shares after that. That's dilution, I mean, to make it as simple. And this, is, and this type of a provision that, you know, Jeremy's saying that is, is necessary to see in there for you know unforeseen circumstances. This is the type of thing that's important when you're looking at an operator to understand what their experience is, to understand that are they allocating enough money? Did they put a rehab buffer in place? That they go through and allocate enough reserves on the side for these extra unforeseen circumstances that can come up. Now it can't happen in every single situation. There's going to be these events that can can occur, but at the same time. You are really, really are betting on your operator as much as you can. So your due diligence, due diligence on the operator is even more important than your due diligence on the actual investment in itself. Yeah, I just want to remind one thing too is that when somebody hires Peter to work on their legal documents, he's representing the sponsor. He's not representing the investors, right? Now clearly, they don't want to put provisions in that are going to put such a big hurdle that investors do not want to invest. But there is. The fact of the matter is that Peter's looking out for the sponsor first, right? That, I'm, that, that's no offense, that's just the way it is. So <laughs> the bottom line is that when I'm reading the documents that is, as an investor, I'm on the other side of the table of the sponsor as regards to the rules, right? Because if they had their way, they'd have literally could do whatever they want and just leave us all out of it. So 
And you'd be surprised sometimes how uh, I actually see sometimes where sponsors don't read the full legal documents, and I actually point something out to them, and they're like, oh, I didn't even realize that that's what would happen. You know? And so and it's because the attorneys obviously know what they're doing, but some of the sponsors may not love reading their own legal documents. And then, so it's really important for you to read them. <laughs> that's because you go over every provision with them to make sure they understand it. But <laughs> yeah, see, so that's the reality. So that's why it's even more important as an investor. You got to just read the rules and know what you're getting into, and don't even necessarily assume that the operator knows them all. But just know them for yourself. Is there a standard operating agreement, quote unquote standard? No. I mean, there's there's a basic. It, they all they all follow the basic construct, but every attorney has had their fingers in it, so. Yeah, every attorney, every sponsor, every. I mean, th there are sort of standard provisions and a standard flow, I think, of operating agreements. <coughs> but, but there are so many variations, um, and Jeremy's seen them all. But, uh, you know, th there, are, there are certain standard provisions, like here's how the cash flow from you know, operations works. Here's what happens upon a sale. Here's trend. I mean, so there are standard provisions, I think, in every operating agreement, but, but it's important to read them each time. Then how does the layman become oriented to the quote standards? Hire somebody like me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are you, courses you can take. Yeah, There's you, also if you go online and, and Google, you and can you get like lots of. Yeah. You look yeah. at a lot of deals. You, you get connected with people like Liz and Jeremy and you know and people in this room, and you just look at a ton of deals. And you should look at 10, 20, you know, ten different operating areas before you decide. You know, hey, I like this one. Although, again, you know, the operator I think is is of prime importance. But to really familiar, and I'd be happy to you know find some samples. And but they all sort of start to look the same or similar, and you get to point out like, oh, now I've seen ten. I know where to look for the transfer. You know, the rights to transfer and things like that. Yeah, I just want to say like I learned from opportunities, but that's what I always recommend. It's really that simple. So if you read enough of them, you'll see that there is reporting. There is cash calls. I mean, I can go over it. There's usually at least ten different sections that are, you know, a starting point in terms of the. We template. have a checklist that we go through when we give right. it to our sponsors, and we're like, if yeah. any of these cause you heartache, please tell me right away because uh, in our placement agreement it literally says the twelve things yeah. that we won't budge on because we would never put an investor in a deal where they disclaim fiduciary. So Who disclaims fiduciary? The standard, your standard form. We also, so. well, but we don't always get to use it. So it depends on how much of the equity we are, but sometimes we try and use our operating agreement because it cuts down on legal because our attorney will then look at it and know they can red line and see where they change things. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, but if we use their operating agreement because we're only a small portion of the equity, we still say to them, like, these 12 things are things that we cannot do. Is we that, will not do. Is that on your website, that list of No. I mean, next to you, email me. Question over here. Yeah, I just had a couple, couple, couple of things. I had a comment and a question for, for Liz, actually. Um, I'm a, an operator, and I've been doing it for a little, little while with apartment buildings. And the capital call thing, I mean, I would I'm totally embarrassed to make a capital call. I mean, I would never do that. I, I, if we ever run short of capital, my partner and I make a partner loan to the partnership and charge them probably zero. Because, you know, you, that's your rep. I mean, you, you know, you, once you start making capital calls, and if you're thinking of investing with an operator, ask them, do you, how, how often do you make capital calls? Have you ever made capital calls in the past? So and if I, they say, oh yeah, yeah, I routinely do it, forget that. Those guys, I mean, you should be smart to, to So I just want to point out, so Dave is actually like a really experienced sponsor, and so you can afford to cover a capital call. So one of the rules that I like to say is that if you're able to invest with a more experienced sponsor, or at least someone who has more money, they can solve a lot of problems. This is actually a problem you can solve because you've got the money. Whereas someone who's newer just doesn't have the money. And it's actually one of, this is precisely one of the advantages of investing with somebody who's more experienced who has a lot more money. And they could just literally lend, you know, they, they could literally lend the whole, the, the LLC money. You don't even know they're lending it if they need to, even if it's for like a day to cover something. Yeah. So we don't get pushed back on right that any of our no, that's we never, It's one of the things that like it is, it would, to our, to, to that point, our mm -hmm. sponsors would be horrified to do a capital call. Yeah. And if they ever did, they're going to they're going to pony up the money. So that's one of the provisions, and I've negotiated you know, dozens on behalf of the firm that uh, I've talked to sponsors, and they never ever touch that. But, yeah, let me tell you, as an investor, what's much more common than a capital call, and especially if you're a capital investor like me, is that 
there could be something that comes up at the property that requires a diversion of some of the cash flow that would have been distributed to you that go towards whatever it has to do so that you're actually getting less cash. And I'll give you a great example. I have an investment in Canada. It's um, a single story office building and we have a government tenant who's actually literally now caused us to expand the building three times. And of course, every time the government wants you to expand the building, you're going to do it. Okay, because it's a government tenant, it's going to add a lot more value. What happens in the interim is that we never budgeted for a government expansion. Our building was only so many square feet, right? This isn't like a development deal. So they've chosen to defer, let's say, one or two quarters cash flow towards that construction along with a construction loan. It's not a capital call, we're actually not getting our distribution. So a, a very different distinction, because capital call is more of a distress situation. This is more like we chose to expand the building, but we also chose to defer cash flow. But, but so a, lot of those, a lot of those types of situations, they're increasing the value as well, which you should get it yeah. later on substantially. I, I want to kind of divert the conversation a little bit away from the capital call because I think we... Do you want me to go back and answer your question about pros and cons from like half an hour ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what I'd really like to do is talk a little bit about the payment structure, what makes a good uh, you know, return structure for investors versus you know, a, a, I guess a negative return structure or a bad return structure for investors for performance-based incentives and things like that. Probably got that you want to talk from the investor's point of view or the sponsor's point of view? From the investor's point of view, oh. yes. <laughs> so we, we've talked about Series A and Series B shares. Talk about how the revenue was split between them and what some of the advantages that creates. So what are some of the bad structures you've seen as well that you would never invest in compared to what you typically like to see? Yeah. Okay, so I'll try and keep it short because it's going to be a long topic. But basically, um, in a normal equity investment, uh, in let's say commercial real estate building, you're gonna to wanna to look for something called a preferred return, which basically means that the first X percent of cash flow based on the amount you invested goes to the investors first, and then after that, there's a split of the additional cash flow or proceeds, a certain split between the investors as a percentage, between the investors and the operator. So there are management fees and everything else that are ahead of that, but once you look at the bottom line of what's distributable in a given quarter or year or whatever it is, um, as an investor, I look for a minimum of an 8% preferred return, which I would say is standard. Now, if you're looking at deals in California, sometimes the preferred return might be 6 or 7% because there's less cash flow in California to begin with because the prices are higher, so you're paying a higher multiple. So probably a reasonable you know, um, preferred return in California is 6 or 7%. I wouldn't personally look for below that. I don't invest in California because the cash flow is lower here for me. But So 8% is what I would say is like the minimum standard, and sometimes you'll find 9 or 10. Um, it's out there. Um, and then as far as splits go, what's probably the most common profit split beyond that is it's usually between 50-50 and 80-20, 80-20 being in favor of investors. So the first thing I would tell you, and I saw a deal recently with a self-storage fund, um, is if you see anything below 50-50, so if the sponsor gets 51%, you get 49 of the profits, I would just run. There's no reason for you to have to do that. There's a lot of deals out there, and that's way out of market. So that's number one. Uh, if you see anything above 80-20, so if you get more than 80% of the profits above a certain preferred return, take a good look at it. It's very unusual. I, I would all, I'll, I'll almost be worried, though, that the sponsor wouldn't be incentivized enough. They wouldn't be getting enough share because you're going to want them to be incentivized. So that would be unusual, and I would flag out, honestly. That would, that would be, you'd want to actually research why that's happening. Yeah, you want to make sure you're aligned properly. With you. you want the sponsor to actually be motivated to perform on this properly. Um, and then anywhere between 80, 20, and 50, 50, the way I look at it is that it's a combination of how much experience does the sponsor have and how much work that they have to do. So on a really stabilized deal where somebody's buying 100% occupied, for, for argument's sake, you're buying Taco Bell down the street, they're paying you like what's called a triple net lease, so that they're actually paying for all the expenses. They're literally just writing you a check to be in the building for the next 20 years. Sponsor is collecting the check and sending it to you, plus or minus, right? Um, they shouldn't be getting a 50-50 split of that because they're not doing a ton of work. Even if they're experienced, they shouldn't be getting a 50-50 split of that, right? So there's, a, there's kind of an intangible formula that goes on to figure out, okay, should you, where should be between 80-20 and 50-50? And a 50-50 deal, it's better be someone who's both experienced and it better be a, a lot of work. It could be a development deal, a really heavy value at deal because anything short of that, they're taking too much of the profit. Well, and, and I think that depends on um on your experience and your relationship base as well. He's talking about what is normally season market for him to go out to, but to be honest, if you guys as operators, or you as operator, or anybody else an operator can find a deal that kills it in cash flow and then gets you a 50-50 and your investors are still killing it, 
I mean, more power to you to go 50-50 on a deal like that if it's if it's in the right range as far as return on investment goes. Even if there's not a lot of work. To, I mean, me as, a, as an operator, I don't do a lot of syndications. I do them every once in a while. Um, but we typically have the same type of splits as the 60-40s and 8% prep and, you know, that type of deal. But, you know, if I found a deal personally that was going to make my 8% prep to my investors and then a 50-50 split was going to hit a 20% return to investors, I don't care what market is. I'm going to go through and say, I'm taking a 50-50 split, or you can go and find another deal to invest in. If I find a deal that's that good, that's going to do it. Because finding the deal is very important. But I also have a lot of relationships. I raise a lot of capital and I have a lot of experience doing this. And at the same time, Jeremy wouldn't invest with me. So, you know, it's but you know, he would actually. No, no, but I, I want to say it's, a, it's an important point though because, yeah, cool. I'm just trying to give. Uh, <laughs> I'm a crazy animator. Like, like you're stealing bring, money from I'm me. trying to bring, uh, trying to bring this excitement to the room about finding <laughs> the deal. Is this a real estate environment? Primarily yeah, residential. Yeah, so residential, residential is really different because what Jeremy and I are primarily doing is cash flow and commercial. And so when you have a current cash flow, it's a different risk profile on the on the residential. For me, on residential deals, I think right. you should put the pref up higher because then you're de-risking it for the investor right, a little right. bit. So I would go into a 50-50 deal if I had a 10 pref on right. it because I'd say, look, I'm either getting a great return and I'm okay with the sponsor right. getting a 50-50. But just from our perspective, when we put out deals that have 50-50, it's really hard to raise capital because it's not quite market. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I can the standard see on is 30 On Jeremy's, I've got the 80 20 split, and I'm going, I'm amazed that the operator is doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to complain yeah. if someone, I think someone should be taking 65 and they're taking 80 20 if they're okay with it. But I, I am very careful to make sure that, that they actually have enough of the deal they're going to be incentivized. But I want to I want to just go back to a point you made, which is really important. As an investor, it's not just about targeting a return. Like, Screw you! I'm, I'm going to give you this. This is a high enough return, so take it or leave it, right? Because he has enough investors, but and screw you is a little harsh. But um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing, of course. It's kind of what we felt for this tirade. But um, but anyway, um, I had one beer. I'm a little buzzed already. So. I, haven't had any, I haven't had anything for the record. So, um, but as an investor, part of the situation is that you should be getting a high return for more risk. So. If you, if you look at something and let's say the split's too high but the return's still high, you should still have to question like why is the return so high? Is it that Matt found this really unbelievable deal? That's one thing, right? Is it that there's a tremendous amount of risk and the return looks okay, but should I be getting even a higher return because there's just a lot of risk there? So don't just focus, you want to make sure you're getting a fair deal on the investor side of the table. Just be careful with just focusing on the return though. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, not really on, risk matters. on the flip side, it also depends on how, how long did I go without seeing you pens? The whole night so far, that's awesome. As a lawyer, I say it depends a lot. Uh, but it does, it depends on the sponsor profile as well. Like we have a, a very successful multi-family operator that's a family office, and they do deals with 100% of the cash flow from the operations to the investors. Because they can wait until the, the property sells, and they always sell within five to seven years, they've been doing this for 40 years, so they make their money on sales, and it's cash flow 100% along the way to the investors, and that's, I think, a, a rare structure, but it works out very well for, for both sides, so. Is that a California typical deal, yeah. or no, it's out of state then, too? Mostly out of state. Interesting. So, okay. you know, it's interesting, because as an investor, that sounds enticing, but I tell you, my concern would be is that they have to keep the lights on for like seven years, right? So they're gonna be taking a management fee, maybe, but if I, if, I was, some fees, but so if I was looking at that deal, I would actually look at their management fee and assess whether I thought it was enough. Because you could say, look, they're billionaires, and maybe maybe they're maybe that's okay. But if they're not, if they're not, that could end up being a problem. So, so, so this sponsor, just so you know, they buy the deals themselves and they syndicate it after they've already purchased the property. So there's absolutely no way. Well, I'll, I'll send. <laughs> they're, they're, they've been around for a long time. You know, the point being, there's a lot of different structures, and um, you know, sometimes you see something that's a little bit out of the ordinary. If you bet the deal and look at the sponsor, it can still be you know, a really good deal. I think you have to be careful, like what Jeremy was saying, about the management fee piece, too, because you don't want that management fee. You know, most management fees are before the ref, right? So, um, so they, yeah, yeah, all the more. So they get an asset center management fee or, or 
um, a management fee based on revenue. And so that comes before the preferred return. So you want to make sure they're not making too much of management fees off your money before you're making money, especially if you're not hitting your preferred return and things like that. So and yeah, and for those of you who are, who are asking the question, how do I know if the management fee is too high? The real way is to go opportunity exposure. I mean, this is how I learned everything myself. I mean, I've been doing it 15 years, but still, I was, I was at point A 15 years ago. And you want to read 10 or 15, if you're looking at investing in an apartment deal, there's a standard that is a typical market range of what a management fee should be. And the way you learn it, if you don't know someone who can answer it for you, is you look at 15 different multifamily deals and you'll see the management fee will be within a certain range and there's outliers. And you want to just stay away from the outliers. And, and I just would add to that, if you are seeing deals where you're like, oh, this is a sweet deal and I'm going to knock it out of the park, um, certain investors are going to look at that with a lot of suspicion. So when I see deals that they say, this is going to be a 58 IRR, I know that's not the market. I know that's not likely. And there, uh, I, had a, I was on a Shark Tank panel uh, with a developer, and he threw out a horrible split. And whenever I was being really difficult. I looked at him and he said, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. And I said, well, it actually absolutely does. Because you've just shown yourself to be like rookie on the block because these are ridiculous splits and your returns are not uh, realistic. And unfortunately, what you've just told me is you don't know what you didn't do your homework, you don't know what you're doing. And so when you see returns that are, yeah, that was not nice. But if you look at it, he's like, you can't hurt to ask. Um, I was nicer when I was talking to him. But, but, but the point being that if your returns look outrageously high and we're in a rising interest rate environment and we have people coming to our platform all the time and saying, oh, this other platform has, still has great returns. Well, it's not that we're looking at worse deals. We're all looking at the same deals. They all come to the same platforms. And it's not, you know, uh, we, we, we basically, there's... Um, there are different sponsors out there, but we're, and we're pretty conservative in how we get our sponsors. We look at guys that have 25 million at a minimum under management. It used to be 100. So we're, we're getting really, really top sponsors, but there is a market out there. And if deals are going and trading way above or showing you, and they're just outrageous returns, there's ways that the sponsor might be fluffing it. And there's, you can play around with the exit cap rate. You can play around with uh, rental growth. You can play around with all these numbers and come out with a return. So I would say to the sponsors in the room, don't do that because you're going to ruin credibility. And it's always better to under-promise and over-deliver. So if you go out to market and you're talking to your investors and you're showing a more realistic, more market return, if you're a mat and you find these amazing deals, you don't have to promise or... Trust me, anytime you put out any kind of returns, yeah. your investors feel like you're promising it. Yeah, you no matter what you say, cut it, back. Cut, it yeah. cut it, cut it, cut it to a reasonable place. Take a look at what your assumptions are. See if you can be more conservative in certain places and be more realistic or be more you know, uh, forward-looking and saying, okay, the market isn't going to appreciate that much. Um, even if you think it's going to, well, then great. If you're right, you're a rock star. If you're wrong, you didn't sell the moon. And I think that's a really important thing to know in syndications is you want to be like, one of the things we learned is we had sponsors that would say to us, I'm going to make a distribution in the first quarter on a value add deal. And then no one ever did. And the reason why they never did is because they needed to get their bearings to see what expenses were going to be. And so now you know you just don't do that. So on almost all of our deals, uh, we were doing them on an annualized basis, so it didn't really matter, but now we try and show quarterly, and when you do that, you should be projecting as, you know, you, you, you're more conservative. You push out your distributions, especially the value-add deals, because you know you got to take some time to catch your bearings in the first couple quarters to figure out what expenses really are, because whatever the pro forma is on the guy that sold it to you, their P&L, you're not going to operate the property the same way. You've got to add value, too, right? Whatever, whatever it is, it's not like this construction takes time. So. Yes. So I want, I want to, we've got about 15 minutes left here. Um, I want to talk about two subjects that we've kind of touched on but really haven't really gathered a lot of momentum on. Number one is due diligence, which you kind of started talking about. And number two is diversification. We really haven't talked about how investing this way helps create diversification. Um, Jerry, I'll, I'll, let's talk about diversification first and the idea of how investing in syndications versus buying into one 
one project, what that means from a, from a risk level in your perspective as an investor? Yeah, so I like to say that I basically trade control diversification. That's what you do when you're investing passively, pretty much. And so what I mean by that is that I am, am going to own a very small percentage of an opportunity, and my vote's going to be somewhat meaningless. I mean, not really, but, you know, just my one vote. Um, and I, I'm okay with that because I'm highly diversified across a lot of things. So when I look to diversify, I basically look to diversify across um, asset classes, geographies, and operators. Um, and if you can get diversified across all three, when, once you've invested enough, you're in a good place from a diversification perspective. But to some of the stuff we talked about earlier tonight, one of the big benefits of, of syndications is that they allow you to put smaller pieces across more deals. So um, a great example is if you want to invest in a house around here and you want to buy a house to rent here, say it's a million dollars. You know, instead of doing that, you can actually invest, and it doesn't have to be commercial real estate, but you can invest in syndication X at $25,000 or $50,000 minimum with the same amount of money be invested across 50 or more things. Um, and there's obviously a lot of advantages to being diversified in general. Um, and um, I would also, you know, one thing you want to consider is that certain asset classes, especially in commercial real estate, are, can have different risks in certain geographies. So there's hurricane risk, there's tornado risk, there's flooding risk, um, there's earthquake risk, there's all different types of risks just in geography, let alone the economics behind a specific geography, um, certain location in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with the properties in the right location. There's all different types of things to consider. But diversification is one thing that I love because I try to be hyper diversified and really my goal is to, to literally go to sleep tonight, wake up tomorrow, and nothing's changed and I, and I get a cash flow paycheck at some point. That's really the way that I do it. So. It's really cool because you can invest in different asset classes, different markets, and different operators, which is really important as well. So some operator blows up on you and you know passes away or blows in Mexico or whatever the heck it is, you have a very small chunk of money with all these different operators. Yeah, and I'm going to say too that um, finding good opportunities, especially now with the market being as high as it is, is very challenging. Really, really challenging. I'm a much happier seller than buyer right now, just in terms of investing in general. And so this is not, like if you had a million dollars to invest across 20 things today, I would say it's going to take you, if you're, if you're really careful and picky, it could easily take you two, three years to figure out how to allocate, that's not more, right? This is not something that you could just do overnight. This is a very slow but steady approach, especially if you want to be properly diversified. And especially because if you find 10 great deals with Matt as an operator, you may want to do 10, you may want to do five, whatever it is, but you're not going to give 100% of your money to Matt, no offense. Um, if you want to be diversified. If you don't want to be diversified, you can definitely take that risk on it. But, you know, you wouldn't want to do that with anybody. So, um, it takes time to be properly diversified. It's, you've got to have the patience for it. And by the way, if you're going to give 100% of your money to Matt, you're going to take his return and like it or walk. We're going to say screw you. My returns are pretty decent, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about, um, uh, on the due diligence, you mentioned like, you guys have checklists and different things, and, and I know all three of you have stuff to talk about on this topic. So. What are some of the things when you're evaluating a sponsor that you're going to look at from a due diligence perspective before you put them on your your your, um, your platform? Peter takes them on as a client, or Jeremy invests in the deal. Yeah, we we've gotten to be very conservative in the sponsorship that we look at. So we um, twenty five million is kind of uh, we we've set that as our base. But what we're really looking for is guys that have experience in the asset class that we're investing in and the market they're investing in. And real estate companies as opposed to individual investors. And the reason for that is if you have a one man band, a guy who may be the best at finding great deals, does he have a team behind him that can handle what we need, which is very institutional in terms of on time distributions, quarterly reports, K ones, all of that stuff that comes with syndications takes up a lot of time and effort and energy. And so if you don't have the infrastructure around you, it makes it really, really difficult, as well as market knowledge. So in this market, you can't just stumble onto good deals. You have to really know your market. You have to have relationships with sellers, relationships with agents that bring you deals that are good deals. It's just not that easy when you're in a seller's market to find good opportunities. And so we found that working with really well healed sponsors is the best way we can present really strong investment opportunities to our investors. So we put them through the ringer. The the good news for us, our, our head of credit was Chief Underwriting Officer at JP Morgan. So she's as dialable credit as, as could be. And, you know, uh, we 
have uh, committees, three stages. So we put everyone through their paces. By the time they do a deal with us, they, they most, of, most of our investors that know the drill because they've done institutional capital raises. So we are kind of somewhere in between the friends and family who don't really, you know, they write a check and the institution who wants their firstborn child. So we're hopefully not that bad, uh, but I think we're probably a little closer to that than we are to the friends and family who just write a check. It, it's a process, but it's really for us, we're a fiduciary. So as a broker dealer, like we don't get to, um, you know, we, we, we've thought about it and we're like, yeah, it would be great if we could help some emerging managers, what they call them when they, when they don't have uh, experience. It's a nice way of saying they have no experience, they're emerging. Um, but for us, it's, it's too much of a gamble, it's too much of a risk for the passive real estate investors out there to be able to understand uh, what they're getting themselves into. That's why we don't do development, we don't do land, we don't do hospitality, we don't do a lot of things that we just think the risk profile is way too high for a retail investor who is um, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief who doesn't know real estate uh, as well as, as our team does. So. Are there, I mean, when you have someone who comes in and wants to hire you, you know, clearly you don't want someone who's going to drag you into a lawsuit in three years. So, what type of things do you do when you're evaluating the client? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's it's really a small community. I mean, you know, the, the same sponsors and the same um, you know lawyers, the same brokers. I mean, pe people. We we look for clients. You know, we we vet clients just like they vet us. Uh, we look for people with good reputations. I mean, we, we do certainly represent, you know, emerging sponsors. Um, we have a lot of smaller clients and a lot of, a lot of larger ones as well. Um, they have to be able to pay, um, <laughs> number one. Um, but, but we really do, you know, we, we sort of interview clients just like you would interview your lawyer. You know, we want to work with the right clients and people with the right temperament. Um, you know, they, they have to be able to listen, they have to be able to, to sort of take direction, and, and it obviously helps if they're, you know, business savvy to begin with. Um, and certainly I think you're, you know, g going to have, with the market the way it is, if, if you're not sort of business savvy and you don't have a good lawyer, accountant, you know, some sort of a, a team that's behind you, it's going to be really difficult to get, you know, to a capital raise or you know, find investors and, you know, we like like people who have some deals under their belt. Maybe they've done a property with, you know, friends and family and now they're looking to do their first syndication or raise their first fund. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the same as what everybody else is saying. We're not, you know, only representing the folks that are on this, is, you know, on Realty Mobile's platform, um, but we want to work with people who, you know, are, are sort of business savvy, um, you know, understand the value of a good attorney. Um, <laughs> and, um, Can I add uh, one more thing that we use that are, is our secret weapon? Uh, and I would say I encourage everyone that you are not on uh, LinkedIn is massively powerful. Because between our head of credit, our CEO, our originators, and me, if someone is in real estate and not connected to one of us, I'd be shocked because we have such a wide net. Um, so if, if we don't know the sponsor, we know someone who knows the sponsor. And so relationships, regardless of the fact that, you know, it's hard for me to say this, we're like, we're a tech platform, we're all, no. Relationships in this business matter. We run tons of sponsors will say, do you know, do you know, do you know? Because if someone else has had a bad experience, now we do background and credit checks, and we're doing all sorts of like deep, deep dive, but we also use our personal network, and I can tell you that when we sit in an investment committee, it's, it's very common that someone will say, I worked on this deal before, or I worked with this sponsor before, or I know his broker, or I know, like the connections are constant, because as big a world as it is, as big a commercial real estate world as it is, it's still fairly small and the top operators are the guys in our range. I should say the guys in our range because there are institutional guys that are up there. They're doing, you know, $100 million projects and up. We're not, we're not doing that. But the guys that are in our kind of general world, there's someone that knows them and reputations follow you. And it's really, really important and impactful and, and something that I, I encourage anyone who's either doing deals or um, investing in deals like when you're doing business with someone, if you don't know them, 
uh, use your network, use your friends, use whomever you can. And LinkedIn is a great way because I was on the phone with someone today and I, he was a real estate broker and I said, I'm sure if we spent five minutes on the phone, we'd figure out who we know in common. And then joking, I was like, I put his name in LinkedIn. I said, we're 47 people we know in common. <laughs> he was like, you're kidding. I'm like, no, nope, I've got a list of 47 people on LinkedIn that you and I are connected through. 47 people. That's how small a world it is. Talk about your process. Yeah, before I do that, I just want to clarify something with Peter. So, <laughs> whoever has not been to an FIBI meeting before, it is not usually this entertaining, <laughs> even though it's a complicated topic. But um, all the panels I'm on, right? <laughs> so, so I, I was actually on a panel at a meeting two months ago at Century City, and I made it. Peter was actually in the audience, and I made a joke about about attorneys, and I pointed to Peter, but. What I was trying to say. <laughs> what I was, it wasn't even on the panel. Yeah, it was on the panel. What, what I was trying to say is that as an investor, attorneys obviously have a ton of value. The sponsors have to use them. It's very important. But as an investor, the good thing is that it all sounds complicated. But at the end of the day, once you read enough of these, it becomes very cookie cutter and very very template. And you you know what to look for. And then so at the beginning, I think there's a lot of value and potentially even hiring an attorney to walk through an, uh, an agreement with you. Like if you if you hire Peter to walk through an agreement with you, I mean, can you imagine the value if you don't know what you're doing? I mean, he actually writes these for sponsors, right? But at some point, if you looked at enough of these like me, I kind of know what to look for. And because there's certain provisions I'm looking for, at this point, I don't hire an attorney anymore. Say it a lot more nicely. So now that we've clarified that. So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so your question about due diligence. So um, what I would say is that as an investor, my goal is to find sponsors who are basically uh, under-promising, over-delivering, and trying to build long-term relationships with investors, and trying to avoid sponsors who are over-promising, trying to make the numbers look really good to attract investors, and they may not care about whether that investor goes into the next deal, they're just trying to find investors every time because they make their numbers look good. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of the way I would summarize due diligence as a starting point. I would say that the one thing to keep in mind is that the person you're making the bet on is by far the number one thing. That's more important than the asset you're investing in. I like to say that you know you can look at the best property on Rodeo Drive that's 100% occupied, but if you are going in with a manager who runs it to the ground, all that's going to happen is that it's going to get foreclosed. Keys are going to go back to the bank, and it didn't matter that you had the best property on Rodeo Drive. So the number one thing you want to look at, and we talked about this tonight already, is a sponsor. And the number two thing is the property. And so when you're trying to bet a sponsor, it's it, in order to determine if they're really being, if they're kind of conservative, under promising, or delivering. You've got to try to read between the lines, and it is a little tricky. You got to kind of read the exact wording that's used. You're kind of you're looking to avoid words like guarantee in a conversation with them or on paper because nothing's ever guaranteed. Um, and you're trying to find someone who, who gives you the response of like, well, we you know we have in our pro forma you're going to get eight percent return year one, but we think we're going to do better. But we used these conservative assumptions to like you know add a little more padding of the uh, a little more conservative, and then run they can run through them with you and show you where they've been more conservative. I actually was on a call today with a sponsor. It was actually a high-risk deal. But the first thing I had them do is I say, look, I know you're really conservative. You're, like, I have your spreadsheet in front of me. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what I need to plug into it to actually, so I can see what you think the returns are going to be. And they literally had me like fill in 10 different cells and overwrite them. And then I saw the returns they actually think they're going to get, and there was a huge spread. So immediately I knew how much padding was in there. I wasn't surprised I'd invested with them many times before, and I knew well enough to even ask them that at the beginning. But that's the kind of sponsor you're looking for, who's just padding the deal so that there's a ton of padding. Um, background checks are critical. Um, I have never talked to, and I actually haven't talked to that many.